Mic check. One, two, three, four, five.
Committee will come to order. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank my uh, good friend, the gentleman from Texas, uh, Judge Poe, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Terrorism, Nonproliferation, and Trade, for joining the Asia and Pacific Subcommittee and holding this hearing this afternoon. Uh, and I, of course, want to thank our ranking member, the gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Felio Movega, and the gentleman uh, from California, Mr. Uh, Sherman, who I believe will be here shortly. Uh, the ranking member of the TNT subcommittee. Um, this year marks a truly important milestone in the U.S.-South Korean alliance as we commemorate the 60th anniversary of the armistice that ended the Korean War. This conflict claimed the lives of more than 170,000 U.S. and South Korean soldiers and more than 370,000 civilians. Sixty years later, our friendship endures and, in fact, has grown stronger. Just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit South Korea with my good friend, the ranking member, Mr. Felio Movega, to meet with President Park, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and other Korean government officials, as well as uh, touring the demilitarized zone and visiting with our American troops uh, who live and work in that stressful and dangerous environment. Today in South Korea, a uh, once war-torn nation has become a world-class economy and leader in high-tech innovation. South Korea's growing commitment to democracy, human rights, and the rule of law is a strong contrast to its northern neighbor. The past 60 years of the U.S.-South Korea relationship is best characterized as a close friendship that has steadily grown. Today, I think I can confidently say that our bilateral relationship is at its best, particularly given the passage and implementation of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement just a little over a year ago. The bond between the people of the U.S. and the people of South Korea is strong and continues to grow. One group that certainly deserves special recognition is the Korean-American community, which has worked tirelessly to ensure that the U.S.-Korea relationship remains strong, relevant, and forward-looking. With the threat of North Korean belligerence always imminent, it is in the U.S.'s and South Korea's best interest to ensure that the next 60 years of this relationship are as strong and as vibrant as the past 60 years. South Korea's economy depends heavily on clean, low-cost energy. Without the benefits of domestic energy resources, South Korea depends almost entirely on imported energy, with the exception of power generated by its domestic nuclear energy power plants. Given the ROK's continued uh, economic growth, it is unlikely that the government can continue to provide enough low-cost electricity to fuel its economy. The ability to recycle nuclear fuel would ease this problem. That is why it is vitally important for the U.S. and South Korea to complete negotiations on a modern 21st century civilian nuclear agreement. The adoption of a new 123 agreement would also have a direct impact on American jobs, in particular manufacturing jobs for those industries supplying South Korea with the components it needs to grow and maintain its power supply. Earlier this month, I joined Chairman Royce and Ranking Member Engel, as well as Judge Poe, Mr. Felia Movega, Mr. Collins, and Mr. Kinzinger, in introducing H.R. 2449, legislation to extend for two years the current U.S.-South Korean Civilian Nuclear Energy Cooperation Agreement, which is scheduled to expire in March of 2014. A clean extension of the agreement, while negotiators continue to work on and refine substantive issues, I believe, is an important and necessary step in this process. I look forward to working with the Chairman and my colleagues in moving the legislation forward. When President Park addressed a joint session of Congress last month, she reaffirmed South Korea's commitment to the vision of a world without nuclear weapons, which must start on the Korean Peninsula. 
South Korea has said time and time again that it is firmly committed to the principle of nonproliferation. In fact, South Korea hosted the second nuclear security summit last year. On the other hand, North Korea has made its intentions quite clear. The Kim dictatorship has no desire to halt its nuclear weapons program, and its recent calls for talks with conditions have to be taken, obviously, with a grain of salt. North Korea takes no responsibility for its behavior, but blames the United States for the worsening situation on the peninsula. The U.S. must maintain a consistent position that makes it crystal clear to the regime in Pyongyang that we will not concede to its unreasonable demands. I hope the administration pursues a path that will increase security for not only South Korea, but for the international community as well. I look forward to hearing from our panel this afternoon, and with that, I yield to the ranking member, the gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Philly Mavega, for his opening statement. And I would note that we're going to have uh, votes on the floor here shortly, so we will be interrupted by that. And also, uh, Mr. Uh, Poe and uh, Judge Poe and myself both are in the Judiciary Committee, and we're marking up one of the immigration bills uh, as I speak. And so we're going to be going around and trying to tag team this to some degree. We hope that doesn't disrupt the hearing too much. So uh, I recognize the gentleman uh, from Samoa, the ranking member, Mr. Fahim Vega. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I do want to thank you both and Chairman uh, uh, Poe for your leadership in calling this uh, joint uh, subcommittee hearing. Also want to offer my personal welcome to Secretary Zumwalt and Secretary Countryman uh, for being witnesses to our hearing this afternoon. Mr. Chairman, you and I recently had the opportunity to meet with President Park Din B at the Blue House on April 29 uh, of this year. President Park is the first freely elected woman leader among the nations of Northeast Asia and the first woman president of the Republic of Korea. She is a, certainly a role model for women everywhere. And just want to note uh, something of a historical uh, uh, matter, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that she's on her way now to uh, Beijing to meet with President Xi of the People's Republic of China. Very, very, uh, what I consider a very uh, interesting movement in terms of what is happening there. I was deeply touched that the first matter which she raised with me during our meeting was an op-ed I wrote about the Comfort Women issue, which was published by the Kyung Hyung Seoul newspaper on the very day we met with her. As you know, during World War II, many young girls were forced into wartime brothels. 200,000 Asian women, Mr. Chairman, were brought in by Japanese imperial forces, and many of these young girls that were forced into sexual slavery were from the Republic of Korea. Today, we affectionately refer to these women as our godmothers. I refer to them as my mothers. Their story is near and dear to my heart, and this is why the first hearing I held as chairman of this subcommittee was about them. I will never forget the courage Madam Park showed in attending that hearing where three victims, two Korean ladies and one Dutch lady sitting right over there, testified. At the time in 2007, even members of Congress were hesitant to show public support for these women who were forced into sexual slavery during World War II. But Madam Park did not hesitate. She sat prominently in the front row of this hearing room and was the first Korean leader ever to attend a hearing in the U.S. Congress in support of these women. I want to once more publicly commend Dr. Uh, Mr. Dong Nong uh, Suk Kim and his organization of the Korean American Civic Empowerment for taking the lead in spearheading community efforts for the successful passage of House Resolution 121 which call upon the Japanese government to issue a formal apology of what they did in, 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 in getting this sexual slavery against some 200,000 Asian women during World War II. I also want to add my voice in support of fully implementing the U.S.-Korean Free Trade Agreement. On March 20 of this year, former Chairman Daniel Ross Layton, our dear friend and colleague in the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I introduced H.R. 1279, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement Fairness Act, a bipartisan legislation which would grant the Republic of Korea nationals a similar visa status for skilled workers as was granted to Australian citizens following the successful negotiation of the U.S.-Australia Free Trade Agreement. Subsequent to the adoption of the Free Trade Agreement with the United States, Australia was able to obtain 10,500 E3 visas per year, which are similar to the H-1B visas from the United States for which only citizens of Australia are eligible. Due to some oversight, the negotiators failed 
to work out an agreement like this for the Republic of Korea during the uh, free trade agreement with uh, negotiations with Korea. And this is why Congresswoman Ross Layton and I work hard in the aftermath to create parity for the Republic of Korea. As long as, as a longstanding ally of the United States, we believe the Republic of Korea deserves fair treatment. And so we put forward a bill which would grant the Republic of Korea nationals 10,500 visas per year for skilled workers that meet the eligibility requirements. Given that our bill provides parity, we were hopeful that our bill would be passed by this House. But regrettably, the uh, Korean Embassy in the United here in Washington decided they did not want parity. They just want a little more than 10,000 visas. I'm not supportive of this higher quota, Mr. Chairman, because it is insensitive to other countries and must specify to our American workers who do not need to be needlessly displaced. I also do not believe we should open up a visa bidding war with the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations coming up. I am supportive of the 123 Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement although I do believe we need to take some time to work out our differences regarding how to treat fuel-making technologies. And so I am pleased that we have simply extended the current agreement for two years until we can resolve these technicalities. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you for the opportunity. I, I thank the gentleman for his statement. We'll recognize uh, uh, the uh, Chairman uh, Poe for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Shabbat, for working uh, to put this important hearing together about the United States-South Korea alliance and the 1-2 agreement uh, together. The South Korean people are allies of the United States. Uh, we have a lot of allies, uh, the United States does, but sp South Korea has a special relationship as an ally. Our two nations, our peoples, have both shed blood together on the same soil uh, in South Korea. That bond uh, makes this relationship unique. South Korea has always been important to us because of its a national security interest in its own right, but our national security interest. And with uh, uh, President Kim in North Korea, or Junior as I like to call him, uh, being a real threat to South Korea and the United States and the rest of the world, uh, it needs to be obvious to us and the South Koreans and the rest of the world that our relationship is strong and will be stronger. Uh, one example of the strength of our relationship is our cooperation on civilian nuclear energy in the last 30 years. We have American companies in South Korea and South Korean companies here in the United States. I have a large uh, uh, Korean community uh, in my district in Houston. And it was good to learn, finally, I didn't know that the ranking member uh, was also a University of Houston law school graduate. I did actually graduate from there after you did, but uh, it's good to hear that. But anyway, in any event, uh, the agreement that we have uh, has allowed cooperation and the so-called 123 agreement expires next March. It turns out a new agreement has been tough to figure out and get done. The sticking point seems to be disagreements over fuel making technologies such as enrichment and reprocessing. Enrichment and reprocessing capabilities are important because they can be used to make material for nuclear weapons. South Korea wants the new 123 agreement to include U.S. advanced consent for future Korean civilian reprocessing and enrichment activities. Now, South Korea says it needs advanced consent to deal with nuclear waste, but it's unclear how dry cast storage would solve this problem. I'm sure our two witnesses will answer that question specifically. Uh, it is unclear how, uh, or excuse me, U.S. law states that it, it is U.S. policy not to give advanced consent to enrichment or reprocessing. There are political issues in the region and international agreements already have been made that have to be considered as well. But time's running out. This past April, the United States and South Korea agreed to a simple two-year extension of the old agreement. I do support extending this agreement because it will prevent thousands of Americans from losing their jobs, from reactor vendors to equipment suppliers, and their hundreds of millions of dollars in bilateral nuclear trade between our two nations. But we just can't keep extending agreements indefinitely. It reminds me of the CR that we constantly do on the House floor on our budget. Uh, we certainly don't, or I don't want another two years to pass and find us right back here, same witnesses, same story, Groundhog Day, trying to make a decision about what to do. Our business community needs certainty 
business, especially in this industry, cannot make financial decisions and other business decisions that may be revoked in two years. Uh, Congress needs to also know that the laws it passes will be followed by this administration and any administration. I'm looking forward from our witnesses uh, as to what the United States should, position should be on these negotiations when it comes to advanced consent and enrichment. I also want to know the difference between two years and a long-range solution and what their ideas are on that. I uh, do bo hope both sides understand the limitations of the other long uh, and a long-term deal until it is made. And I also want to do comment about the issue that the ranking member has brought out of the comfort women. Uh, that is an issue that is very important, uh, not just for South Korea and Japan, but it's important for us to move forward and get that issue resolved uh, as soon as possible. Uh, that is a historical event that cannot be ignored, and we should not ignore it here some many 60 years later. Uh, but that's a different issue for a different day, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his statement, and I would just note the chair agrees with both of the gentlemen on the comfort women issue, and thank them both for bringing it up. I think we have time to get in the opening statement, so we'll recognize the uh, ranking member of uh, the TNT committee, gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Thank you. The Republic of Korea and the United States enjoy a strong strategic alliance and warm friendship. The relationship is based on our commitment to security, democracy, and prosperity. October 1, 2013 will mark the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Mutual Defense Treaty between the United States and the Republic of Korea. Nearly 40,000 members of the United States Armed Forces lost their lives defending the people of Korea. Nearly 30,000 troops are stationed in South Korea today. Uh, the United States has stood with Korea on the comfort woman issue, even though um, another strong ally of the United States is on the other side. And the Korean American community with its 1.7 million members is, all, is an important part of the bilateral relationship and uh, of uh, the American fabric. Uh, I did not support the uh, U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, uh, which became effective uh, roughly a year and a few months ago. We have seen a, we were told at the time that this would reduce the trade deficit uh, with uh, South Korea. In fact, that deficit has increased. Um, we, the deficit hit an all-time high of $2.4 billion in April 2013. Uh, imports hit a record high, while U.S. exports to South Korea actually were less January to April 2013 than January to April 2012 before the agreement really went into effect. Uh, this translates into a loss of jobs. Uh, we need a more balanced trade policy. And as I've said before in this room, if we continue our trade policy, there will be a catastrophic drop in the value of the United States dollar. But don't worry, it won't happen in the next five years, or probably won't happen in the next five years. North Korea continues its uh, threats of military aggression against our ally including the March 10 sinking of the uh, naval ship, uh, the bombardment of uh, Young Pyong uh, Island. Yeah, the 2013 Korea, uh, Korean crisis uh, was an escalation of military attentions by North Korea against South Korea. Um, the United States and Japan began follow, uh, um, that is to say it was aimed at all three of those allies. Um, and it began following the launch of the uh, so-called satellite December 12, 2012, and uh, the third nuclear test February 12, 2013. Kim Jong-un, the new leader uh, uh, of this totalitarian regime, has used extreme rhetoric. Uh, at, one, at more than one point, he's threatened uh, imminent attack against the United States homeland. The international community has condemned North Korea and its military aggression. Uh, in uh, March uh, 7, uh, 2013, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2094 um, is just the latest example of that. Uh, Congresswoman Ilya ross Layton and I have uh, introduced the Iran, North Korea, and Syria Nonproliferation Accountability Act of 2013. We introduced the earlier version of that act uh, back in 2011. I urge my colleagues to co-sponsor that legislation, uh, which would target those firms and states that assist North Korea as well as Iran and Syria uh, a develop uh, and build nuclear uh, weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. 
The main reason our uh, subcommittee is involved in these hearings is because of the focus on uh, the nuclear cooperation agreement between South Korea and the United States. South Korea plans to significantly expand its already advanced nuclear program in the coming years and decades. The United States has been committed to a denuclearization of the peninsula and thus is opposed to reprocessing uh, uh, and enrichment on the peninsula. The gold standard model uh, for one, two, three agreements or nuclear cooperation agreements is uh, embodied in our agreement with the United Arab Emirates, which legally binds uh, U.S. partners to forswear enrichment and reprocessing. So it comes down to enrichment and reprocessing. The United States and South Korea have recently agreed on a two-year extension of our agreement rather than revising the agreement, uh, but both countries uh, would like to see a long-term deal. Seoul would like to uh, enrich uranium and reprocess spent, uh, fuel rods to develop and expand its nuclear power industry. I commend the administration for not agreeing to advance consent rights for plutonium reprocessing of fuel of U.S. origin. South Korea wants a nuclear agreement that provides uh, U.S. Uh, advance consent for such reprocessing, and that would carry deep uh, proliferation concerns. Uh, I look forward to further negotiations with South Korea and to the resumption of this hearing after votes. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, we have votes on the floor. Uh, I would estimate we'll be back in about a half hour to 45 minutes uh, for the series of votes. The committee is in recess.
The committee will be back in order, and we have uh, several members who might like to make one-minute statements. We'll begin with uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And, uh, and indeed, I uh, would like to uh, express my appreciation of our relationship with the Republic of Korea. I've had the unique opportunity uh, to visit South Korea several times, and each time uh, you've, uh, I visit, it's just awesome to see how dynamic the people are uh, and uh, what a great alliance that we have of shared values uh, working together. And just honored to be here and uh, look forward to working, uh, particularly with a civilian nuclear agreement. I just see such positive. Uh, my home state of South Carolina, we have Westinghouse Nuclear Fuels, Toshiba. Uh, it is a, uh, a classic case of uh, mutual self-benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding the hearing and for our guests for coming to testify. Uh, the alliance between the United States and the Republic of Korea has brought stability, security, and prosperity to the peninsula and the Asian Pacific region. Recently, the U.S.-Korean free trade agreements demonstrated our mutual commitment of shared future economic growth and prosperity. Trade between our countries totaled around $100 billion in 2012, and it's expected to grow significantly in the coming years because of the liberalized trade between the two countries. It's not to say we don't face our challenges. Obviously, we see with North Korea's nuclear and ballistic program, uh, we have to continue to stay on our toes and stay committed to a, uh, to a situation there, a peaceful solution. Uh, I want to briefly discuss extending the, the uh, bilateral civilian nuclear cooperation, better known as the 123 Agreement. As an original co-sponsor of 2449, I fully support the two-year extension that's been agreed to in principle by the negotiators from the U.S. and the Republic of Korea. Substantial progress has been made, but more times needed to complete a new agreement that recognizes both our country's status as a global leaders of nuclear energy. I agree with Assistant Secretary Countryman's testimony that swift passage of this two-year extension would give both countries the confidence that they need that our cooperation will continue smoothly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Holding, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the administration's refocus on the Asia-Pacific region and the growing influence of China in that region, the importance of maintaining strong economic and security ties with our allies in the Pacific has never been more vital. The United States and the Republic of Korea have enjoyed an enduring strategic relationship, indeed, Mr. Chairman, an alliance forged on the battlefield over 60 years ago and one that grows closer today with tightened economic ties and increased threats from hostile neighbors. Later today, Mr. Chairman, in the Judiciary Committee, I'll offer an amendment to help realize the full potential of the free trade agreement passed in 2011 by increasing the number of visas available for highly educated and highly skilled Korean uh, workers and students. The addition of these visas will be an added benefit to the U.S. economy and further solidify our strategic relationship. Uh, thank you for calling this here, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now introduce the panel here this afternoon. I'll begin with uh, Mr. Zumwalt, uh, who began his tour as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Japan and Korean Affairs on January 3, 2012. He previously served as Embassy Tokyo's Deputy Chief of Mission. His prior assignments include Director of the Office of Japanese Affairs, Economic Minister Counselor in Tokyo, and Economic Minister Counselor uh, in Beijing. He has also worked on the Korea and Philippine desk in Washington. Mr. Zumwalt is fluent in Japanese and also speaks some Chinese and French. And uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Thomas Countryman, who is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service and is currently serving as the Assistant Secretary for International Security and Nonproliferation. He previously served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Political Military Affairs and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for European Affairs. Mr. Countryman began his State Department career in 1982, serving as a Consular and Political Officer in Belgrade. His prior assignments include Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs at the National Security Council, Minister Counselor for Political Affairs at the American Embassy in Rome, Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Athens, and its Foreign Policy Advisor to General James Conway, the Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps. He speaks Serbo-Croatian, Arabic, Italian, Greek, and German. And just for the record, I took a little Latin in high school and a little French in college, and I think I got a C in both, so. 
And uh, we would now recognize each of the witnesses for five minutes. And uh, we have a lighting system, and the yellow light will let you know that you have a minute to wrap up. And the red line would ask you to conclude your testimony. So, Mr. Zumwalt, you're recognized uh, for five minutes. Chairman Shabbat, Ch uh, Chairman Poe, Mr. Fellow Mavenga, members of the subcommittee, I'm uh, pleased to appear before you today to discuss this important topic. Um, I've submitted a longer statement for the record, and with your permission, I'd like to del deliver briefer oral remarks. The Republic of Korea Alliance is a, a linchpin of security and prosperity in Northeast Asia, and our bilateral ties have never been stronger. Today, while our alliance continues to counter the threat from North Korea, we are expanding our cooperation to meet 21st century challenges. During her May 8 address to a joint meeting of Congress, Republic of Korea President Park Geun-hye said, along our journey, we have been aided by great friends, and among them, the United States is second to none. What she was referring to is that our alliance was forged in shared sacrifice in the Korean War. Today, we continue to strengthen and adapt our alliance to meet existing and emerging security challenges. We have made significant progress on the blueprint for the future of our alliance, which outlines conditions for the transition of wartime operational control to a Republic of Korea-led defense in December 2015. We continue to improve our interoperability and readiness through annual exercises. Our cooperation on global challenges is an increasingly important pillar of our alliance. Today, American and Korean soldiers stand side by side in Afghanistan. Korea has been a leader in supporting Iran sanctions. We are working together in Syria. Our deep economic cooperation forms the engine of our strategic relationship. The Republic of Korea is Asia's fourth largest economy and our seventh largest trading partner. Our two countries' trade topped 100 billion U.S. dollars in 2012. This year marks the first anniversary of the entry into force of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. This agreement is increasing trade and investment between our two countries and provides significant new opportunities for U.S. exporters. We look forward to even more economic benefits as more provisions of the agreement are implemented. Our ties include strong cooperation in science and technology on cyber issues and climate change. The United States and Republic of Korea are also global leaders and partners on peaceful nuclear energy. We both recently decided to seek an extension of our civil nuclear cooperation agreement, and we are in the process of negotiating a successor agreement to continue and expand this cooperation. The administration is ready to work with Congress to achieve an early extension of the existing agreement, and we are grateful for your efforts on the related uh, uh, pending draft legislation. The foundation of our partnership rests on our people-to-people -people ties and our shared commitment to freedom, democracy, and rule of law. Last year, more than one million South Koreans visited the United States. The Republic of Korea sends more university students to the United States per capita than any other major economy. The United States is the clear top choice for Korean entrepreneurs, scientists, and engineers who wish to come here to create businesses and create new jobs and develop new technologies. And we very much support efforts to facilitate these exchanges. Let me now turn to our greatest challenge, North Korea. Many of the DPRK's provocations in recent months have been directly targeting the United States and the Republic of Korea. We remain fully committed to the defense of the Republic of Korea, and we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with our ally in the face of these provocations. Despite North Korea's recent overtures, we have yet to see concrete steps suggesting that North Korea is prepared to negotiate on the key issue, the verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We will continue to coordinate closely with the ROK and with other, other six-party partners. The United States remains committed to authentic and credible negotiations to implement the September 2005 joint statement of the six-party talks and to bring North Korea into compliance with its international obligations. We will not accept North Korea as a nuclear armed state, nor will we reward the absence of bad behavior or provide compensation merely for talking. U.S.-North Korea relations, moreover, cannot fundamentally improve without sustained improvement in inter-Korean relations. In conclusion, the U.S. ROK alliance has never been stronger, and both our countries are working actively to prepare for the future. President Park's landmark visit to Washington this past May opened a new chapter in our partnership. 
strong and enduring congressional support for our alliance and partnership with the Republic of Korea has been critical to the success of our relationship for the last six decades and will be even more important in the future. Thank you for inviting me to testify on this important topic. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Countryman, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Chairman Chabot, Chairman Poe, Ranking Member Folio Mavaenga. I think that the uh, mic is either not on or it's not close enough. All right. Mr. Chairman, Chairman Poe, Ranking Member Folio Mavaenga, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for this opportunity to testify about the negotiations on an ex a successor agreement for peaceful nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea. The U.S. and the ROK continue to be strong allies across the spectrum of political, security, and economic issues. I like the way Judge Poe put it. We have many allies, but the ROK is a special case, and I don't believe any single issue can undo this alliance. In the nuclear realm specifically, our two countries have a long history of working together on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, and we press forward today with our shared objective of achieving the verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in a peaceful manner. Today I want to focus on this first area, the long-standing peaceful nuclear cooperation between our two countries. The U.S. and the Republic of Korea are in the process of negotiating a new agreement for peaceful nuclear cooperation, generally referred to as a 1-2-3 agreement. The current agreement entered into force in March 1973 and expires in March 2014. The U.S. and the ROK began negotiating a successor agreement in 2010, and we've made substantial progress in negotiating a text that will extend our long and fruitful partnership into the future. Because of the breadth and depth of our current and future nuclear cooperation, our two countries jointly decided to seek a two-year extension of the existing agreement to give us more time to complete negotiations and then fulfill our respective domestic requirements to bring the new agreement into force. The extension will facilitate the efforts of both our governments to finalize an agreement that promotes U.S. and South Korean objectives and requirements for nonproliferation and civil nuclear cooperation. An extension would ensure that there is no lapse in our ongoing civil nuclear cooperation, preserving stability and predictability in our joint commercial activities. The two sides have pledged to work together diligently and to conclude negotiations on a successor agreement as soon as possible. In this regard, I want to thank Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, and other members of the committee who have co-sponsored the pending draft legislation, which would authorize the President to extend the current term of the U.S. Republic of Korea agreement until March of 2016. The administration stands ready to work with Congress to achieve the extension of this existing agreement. An early passage of this legislation would provide confidence to both countries, including our respective nuclear industries, that our civil nuclear cooperation will continue smoothly. Mr. Chairman, the United States and the Republic of Korea are approaching these negotiations as close allies and partners committed to advance both countries' global leadership in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and preventing nuclear proliferation worldwide. I'm confident our two governments can produce a successor agreement that serves as a strong foundation for our bilateral civil nuclear cooperation for the future and reaffirms our common commitment to nuclear nonproliferation. So thank you again for this opportunity to discuss this important aspect of our relationship with our ally, the Republic of Korea. I look forward to your questions, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, I'd like to ask this to both of the uh, gentlemen. Um, without commenting on the negotiating positions and, and your opinions, 
Um, how much importance does the government of the Republic of Korea uh, assign to the successful renewal of the 123 agreement, the civilian nuclear cooperation agreement? And, and why is it important to the U.S.? And uh, what are the implications uh, uh, to the U.S. Korea alliance uh, if, for some reason, the agreement uh, is not, not renewed? And I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Zumwalt, if that's okay. I think the agreement is very important to the Republic of Korea, partly because of the successful relationship our industries have, they would like to see a continuation and an enriching of that relationship. Mr. Countryman? The agreement is important to both governments. It serves as a commitment to each other that we are both determined to remain both technical and commercial leaders in the global nuclear power industry. It ensures that we continue to share the vital goal of preventing nuclear nonproliferation and, of course, renewing it on time, uh, given this two-year extension, will prevent any interruption in our commercial cooperation, which is essential both for United States provision of fuel and equipment to nuclear power plants in the Republic of Korea and to U.S. content in the power plants that the Republic of Korea is selling, for example, to the United Arab Emirates. And I am confident that we will not reach that situation of facing those consequences because of the joint determination of both countries to get a good agreement done within the time that we hope you will permit us. Thank you. Um, last week, North Korea's uh, UN ambassador held a news conference uh, during which he claimed uh, North Korea was essentially blameless for tensions on the Korean Peninsula and that their recent nuclear uh, and missile tests were purely for self-defense. Uh, he further claimed that the U.S. is entirely responsible uh, for the ever-worsening situation on the Korean Peninsula. Now, the history of, of dealing with North Korea uh, has been they act up, they act outrageous, uh, stomp around, uh, and we criticize them. and. Then at some point, we and our allies essentially buy them off uh, with food and or fuel. Uh, they promised to be better, and for at least some short period of time, at least publicly, uh, they are. Uh, and then they act up again, and we start this process uh, all over again. Um, how should we avoid this uh, uh, in the future? And uh, I'll again start with you, Mr. Semmel, if I can. As I said in my statement, we are determined not to reward um, North Korea for provocation or for refraining from provocation or merely for coming back and talking. So what we have stated uh, and is that we uh, would, are open to authentic and credible negotiations which focus on denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but we are not interested in talks until we see that North Korea is serious and the way we would see this is by North Korea taking some concrete steps that show us that they've really changed their position. So what, so what our strategy now is, is to engage uh, friends and partners in the region, uh, the other six party partners, particularly China, who has a unique relationship with North Korea and encouraging China to use its influence to try and persuade North Korea to take a different tack. Thank you, Mr. Countryman. Nothing to add to that, sir. Okay, all right. Under uh, President Park, uh, South Korea intends to reach out and develop closer uh, ties with China. And as uh, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Philly and Vega mentioned, uh, uh, President Park is meeting uh, with uh, President Xi, uh, I believe today, or at least they were heading there today. Um, what can we expect from this visit, would you say? How is this going to affect uh, future relations, um, and et cetera? I, relatively briefly. We've had extensive uh, consultations with Korea about China, and we, uh, although I don't want to speak for the Korean government, obviously, we think it's uh, very helpful that she goes to China and talks directly, and I think she will be asking China to use its influence to persuade North Korea to become serious about living up to its commitment to denuclearization. Thank you, Mr. Countryman. All right, All right. I will uh, now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Fahim Vega, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. Uh, <clears throat> Just a couple of questions. Uh, Secretary Zumwalt, you had uh, uh, may give an indication that, did you say that uh, the United States will not accept North Korea as a nuclear armed state? 
Fact of the matter is, North Korea already has in its possession eight to 10 nuclear weapons. How do you denuclearize a state that already has nuclear weapons? North Korea has expressed, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, they, but North Korea has also expressed the desire to improve the welfare of its people. And our strategy is to convince North Korea that it's not possible both to be a nuclear weapons state and to have the kind of economic engagement with the world that would improve the livelihood of the uh, North Korean people. So we're working with friends and allies in the region, including China, Japan, South Korea, and others, to impose uh, economic sanctions that would, uh, we hope would persuade North Korea that it must uh, choose a different tack, uh, begin serious negotiations about denuclearization so it can achieve what it wishes, which is improving the livelihood of the North Korean people. Mr. Countryman. I would just add not to underestimate the difficulty of the task, but the fact is that a unified world community sending a consistent message caused four states already, uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and South Africa, to give up possession of nuclear weapons. It ain't easy, but it can be done. You know, we have been uh, participating in this six-party talks uh, with North Korea for the last six or seven years, I believe. Uh, I certainly have some very serious questions on the validity uh, and the value of continuing these six-party talks because, in my humble opinion, they've been a failure. And, uh, Secretary Zawa, can you comment on that? Should we continue having these six-party talks because it seems like it's been a, just a whole bunch of rhetoric. Uh, you said this, I said that, and uh, tit for tat, but then no results. Can you comment on this? Should we continue having the six part? And why should Russia be part of this? When in fact, at least if I'm wrong, all North Korea wanted was to negotiate with the United States and perhaps even with South Korea. And the other countries don't seem relevant, but I may be wrong. Could you uh, uh, enlighten us on this? I agree with you that the purpose of talks is not to have talks, but rather to achieve an objective. And our objective is denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And that's why our position now is we won't engage in six-party talks until we see that North Korea is serious about uh, implementing its international obligations and its own statement that it would uh, aim for denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So until North Korea shows us that it's serious about this, we won't be engaging in talks. The fact of the matter is, and I may be wrong, the only American that has ever met with Kim Jong-un is a gentleman by the name of Dennis Rodman. Now, that's not exactly my idea of uh, a serious negotiation, but the problem is uh, we, if you call them experts or whatever uh, we have out there, it's anybody's guess as to exactly what is in the minds of the leaders of North Korea for all this time. And I was just wanted to ask, uh, Mr. Countryman, you said that uh, we do have this one, two, three nuclear uh, uh, agreement with, with South Korea. Do we have similar agreements with other countries? For example, is it similar to the one we have with India? Uh, each one, two, three agreement uh, concluded under the authority of the Atomic Energy Act uh, has certain common elements as mandated by Congress but each has unique elements that address the particular level of development of that country and the level of cooperation that we in that country are seeking to have with each other. Uh, so yes, everyone is similar, but everyone has unique characteristics as well. Well, I'm sure that uh, one of the concerns that everybody has is it's, uh, whether or not someday that even South Korea may want to have nuclear capability for the simple reason that it wants to defend itself no more than you would Japan, or China, or, or other countries that have in their position nuclear weapons. Uh, and I'm sure that this is part of the stipulations in this agreement that we're working on. But let's say, and I'm being hypothetical about this, do you see a real sense of realism in the fact that maybe one day that South Korea may want to exercise that option, that they want to also become a nuclear power just like other countries? Secretary Zumwalt. Uh, President Park has stated very clearly her policy that, she, nor, that South Korea does not seek nuclear weapons. In her address to the joint meeting of Congress, she said she supported President Obama's mission of a nuclear-free world, and she said, let it start on the Korean Peninsula. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. That's quite all right. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Post, recognized. Thank you both for being here, and thank you for your candor. Although it seems to me it's a little tactful candor, uh, let me just ask you bluntly, uh, Mr. Zumwalt, uh, does uh, North Korea have nuclear weapons, in your opinion? North Korea has engaged in three nuclear tests, and we are very concerned about their nuclear weapons. So that would be, is that a yes? <laughs> Pick a horse and ride it. Is it yes or no? They have, yes. <laughs> Mr. Zumwa, I mean, Mr. Countryman, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh. All right, thank you. Um, if um, the United States proceeds after the 123 agreement uh, on a long term agreement with the, um, the, the the problem being uh, the in, uh, advance to consent to enrichment and reprocessing. Uh, do you think, in your opinion, we should m make that additional step and grant that to South Korea? Well, in the 123 agreement, that is, of course, one of several key questions that we are deciding. Uh, and that we are negotiating. So I wouldn't go into deep detail about how we will resolve these issues between our two sides. Do you have an opinion? Uh, certainly. Can I hear what it is? <laughs> <laughs> My opinion is that it is premature to decide every potential question. Rather, what we need to find is a process by which the U.S. and the ROK can together as partners, make smart decisions about technologies on the basis of economics, technical feasibility, and nonproliferation concerns. All right. Based on your expertise, both of you, we, we move forward with that step. North Korea, Junior up there, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? What's he going to do? do you, what's his reaction? I'm talking about the President, Kim, excuse me. Uh, I think the ranking member also has already pointed out that predictability is not the strongest suit of the DPRK. <laughs> uh, so I'm reluctant to make a prediction, but it is an issue that we are constantly discussing with our key allies in the region, the ROK in Japan, as well as with the Chinese. Uh, and I think that we, I'll let uh, Mr. Zumwalt comment further, but I think we do try to take into account, to the extent possible, the predicted result, the predicted reaction from Pyongyang. Mr. Zumwalt. Yeah, earlier when I had said we were looking to North Korea to take concrete steps to show it's serious about uh, denuclearization, one type of step it could take is inviting back IAEA um, into its own nuclear program, and that would provide a lot of reassurance in the region. So certainly the kinds of things we're talking about with South Korea, I, I think, um, are the types of things we'd like to talk about with North Korea as well in terms of, of uh, oversight of a nuclear program. Different issue, Japan. Uh, what's Japan's uh, position on our 1-2-3 agreement and, uh, with Korea? And then if we move forward with uh, advanced consent to enrichment and reprocessing. Since you worked in both places and you speak all the languages, what, uh, what is your answer, Mr. What do you think, Mr. Zumwalt? You know, Japan right now is undergoing its own rigorous debate about the future of its civilian nuclear power industry. And as you know, there's a lot of opposition in Japan to continue its civilian nuclear program. At the same time, they have a lot of technologies and are, are interested in exporting nuclear power as well. So I, I would, what I would answer, I guess, is the debate is ongoing in Japan, and it's not clear how they're going to come out. Maybe my question wasn't clear. I'm not really talking about Japan. I'm talking about Japan's position on us dealing with North Korea. I mean, South Korea, excuse me. I don't want to speak for the Japanese government, but I've not heard in many years living there concerns about the South Korean civilian nuclear program. Right. Mr. Countryman. I, I would say the same, that the Japanese have not expressed, to my knowledge, a view to the U.S. government uh, about the, uh, our negotiation with a separate partner. I'm not sure it would be appropriate for them to do so. We deal with each friend on our own terms, on the terms of that relationship. And then back to the question we're all here in the next 15 seconds. Uh, how would the U.S. economy be affected 
if the one, two, three agreement is not approved? Thank you. As I mentioned, there are negotiate, there are exports from the United States. I'm just trying to find the right numbers here. Uh, in the last 10 years, from 2001 to 2010, nuclear industry exports from the U.S. to the ROK totaled $181 million in those 10 years. Another example of the kind of cooperation is the contract between the ROK and the United Arab Emirates for nuclear reactors. Westinghouse and other U.S. companies will carry out about 10 percent of the work associated with this project, amounting to about $2 billion in equipment and services and about 5,000 American jobs across 17 states. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Hawaii, uh, Ms. Gabbard, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I actually had a follow-up uh, regarding the benefits here, uh, specifically with U.S. jobs. I know the time had expired. I'm wondering if you had anything add, to add specifically on that, considering a lot of the discussion has taken place on um, the benefit to our relationship with South Korea and the challenges that we're facing there uh, in the region. Uh, and wanted to see if you could add anything else just to what this uh, extension of the current 1-2-3 agreement does to both benefit the U.S.-Korea alliance, but also benefit us uh, here in the United States from an economic perspective. Thank you. I don't think I'll add additional numbers. These are estimates generated by the Nuclear Energy Institute, a uh, uh, industry association who we respect. I think what I would emphasize uh, that is always a concern for us is the predictability of commercial contracts that the uh, maintaining the kind of cooperation that we have, the kind of exports that we hope to grow in the nuclear field requires countries such as the ROK and the United States to be able to rely on each other and to have that predictable business environment. So that's the point that goes beyond the numbers. The other point is that the United States and the ROK, I think, have been the most dynamic and innovative of all states in developing their nuclear power industries respectfully. If we both want to stay on top of this, that is, we both want to continue to have a reputation in the United States for producing the world's safest reactors for export, uh, I think that we need to have that kind of predictability which I'm confident we'll achieve by conclusion of a new agreement. We need this two-year extension in the meantime. Thank you. you know, as we talk about uh, how uh, we deal uh, here in the United States, but also within the region with the nuclearization of North Korea, uh, you know, we discussed President Obama's meeting with President Xi, President Park meeting with him now as well. Uh, what what do you expect uh, the outcomes of these discussions to be in the context of doing something differently than we have been to come out with a different outcome uh, and to get us out of the vicious cycle that we've been in for so long with North Korea? Uh, and really, what are the objectives now for the State Department to move towards uh, the clear goal of denuclearization? We've been, in, we've been encouraged by recent discussions with the Chinese, including uh, the Chinese president, that China shares the same goal that we do of seeing a denuclearized Korean Peninsula because I think China's made it very clear uh, recent actions by North Korea are, have not been in China's own interest. And so we want to work closely with China to uh, implement UN sanctions in a way that will be, be more persuasive to change North Korea's mind that it really has to take a different approach toward this. So right now our efforts are not on, on uh, talks with North Korea but more on creating the right environment so that in the future we might be able to have such talks leading to denuclearization. Do you think that China's buy-in uh, to this collective strategy is essential to meeting that objective? China plays an essential role. You know, they border North Korea and have the most vibrant economic relationship, so their role is essential, yes. And last question, you know, South Korea in the last few years has been developing its own Korean air and missile defense, um, understandably with the threat that comes from the North. Uh, what kinds of coordination and engagement, has there been engagement there so that there is a coordinated effort uh, with South Korea and other East Asia allies to make sure that they're... Um, 
the coverage is not duplicative and the efforts are, are done so in a way that benefits uh, our shared interests? Yes, we've had um, a, a long a series of discussions with our allies, Republic of Korea, about what needs the alliance faces. And given the heightened threat from North Korea of North Korea's own missiles, uh, we jointly agreed that there's a need for some additional capabilities. And that's one reason we came to an agreement with the Republic of Korea about its revised missile guidelines so that we can address some of these concerns. And with, with our allies uh, within the region as well as others, has their missile defense development been um, received well? Yes, in fact, um, I think everyone is concerned about the threat of North Korean missiles and wants to uh, strengthen uh, missile defense. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The uh, gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Yoho, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, good afternoon. Appreciate you being here. Um, it's, Korea, to me, is an amazing story about where it came from 60 years ago to where we are now, and I think we've all seen that satellite picture at night of the southern peninsula and the northern peninsula. Uh, the, the remarkable difference between what happens in a free society, we surely want that to continue. Um, coming from Florida, and my background is in agriculture, we're real happy about the, the free trade agreement, and I hear from my cattle uh, men in our district how uh, impressed they are with uh, the way the Koreans love our, our Florida beef, and we want to keep that going. Uh, in fact, they said it's, they like that, they prefer it over the Australian beef, and so we're proud to report that back. Um, how do you envision a South Korea-China relationship under President Park, number one, and how will this affect our relationship with South Korea? And how will it affect both of their relationship with North Korea? Well, thank you very much for your endorsement of, uh, of U.S.-Korea uh, free trade you know, policy. We do have a lot of good news, particularly in the area of agriculture. Koreans very much appreciate high-quality, safe, um, inexpensive U.S. products, and I think, I think we'll have bright prospects for the future as well. Did I mention our grapefruits from Florida, um, too? In fact, uh, <laughs> citrus exports have been among the brightest of our, uh, of our prospects, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's very that's good. good. Um, but getting to the Korea-China relationship, you know, obviously China to Korea is a very important country. It's their largest trading partner. It's a very large economy right on their doorstep. But also in dealing with North Korea, the, the South Korean government recognizes that China plays a critical role. We have had extensive discussions with South Korea about relations with China, and we're very comfortable with President Park's visit. We think it will be helpful uh, in terms of convincing China to play a more active role dealing with North Korea. So we are uh, expecting uh, to hear some good results of her visit there and want to continue working closely with Korea as we both engage China. Thank you. Mr. Countryman? Nah. No. You know what? I got, I got to give you guys credit. I've been through a lot of these. You guys have short, succinct answers, and I know we all appreciate that. Uh, I hope my questions are short and succinct. Um, let's see. What can the administration do to strengthen the U.S. Uh, relationships in the Republic of um, uh, South Korea? I mean, what else can we do? You know, obviously, although we have an agreement on Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, we do have implementation going forward, and we want to continue engaging with each other to make sure implementation goes smoothly. Our agreement is uh, that by 2016, 95 percent of U.S. Uh, manufactured exports would enter Korea duty-free, and so we anticipate increased uh, exports, but obviously want to keep working to make sure that the promise of that agreement is implemented. On people-to-people -people ties, we have some uh, very good prospects to continue encouraging Koreans to visit the United States, come to U.S. colleges. I know uh, immigration issues are being debated now, and that's the a very, visa agreement would that's, increase that would help. That that's a very important discussion, and uh, is something that could continue strengthening ties. And then finally, continuing to strengthen our security alliance is very important. Several uh, members have commented on how North Korean threats uh, create a perception in South Korea of a challenge. And so one thing we need to do is to continue reassuring our allies that we are, will be there for them, we'll be providing our extended deterrence guarantee, the nuclear umbrella, so that Korea is not tempted to, to uh, Im implement its own nuclear program. They can count on us, and we need to keep providing that reassurance. Okay, thank you. Same? <laughs> well, from where I sit, I would only emphasize the security relationship our security commitment to each other is absolutely unbreakable, but it is not self-implementing. That is, we have to work together on a daily basis, make sure we understand each other, make sure we've divided our roles and responsibilities accurately, 
And I think that we do that on a daily basis, the military to military relationship and the understandings we have with each other on the political level. Uh, that kind of security understanding is the backbone of this relationship. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Chairman, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Ambassador uh, Zumwalt, uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll spare you a question. I'll just give you the, the comment. Uh, we've seen an increase in imports from South Korea that is larger than the increase in exports. As In fact, we've seen a decline in exports uh, after the effectiveness, uh, after the uh, U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement went into effect. Uh, others from the administration in this room have said, well, there's not necessarily a relationship between uh, trade deficits and the loss of jobs. And uh, rather than let you re repeat that canard, I'll simply go on to uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Mr. Country, Assistant Secretary uh, uh, Countryman. But uh, uh, <coughs> there is not a foreign service in the world that is not 10 times more dedicated to exports than our State Department. And there is not a foreign service in the world that doubts that trade deficit leads to lo job losses in their own country. Uh, the State Department is alone in its approach uh, to trade. Uh, Assistant Secretary uh, uh, Countryman, uh, if I may quote your testimony, you say it some, takes some time to resolve the technical issues in the 123 agreement. Uh, the problem uh, or the, the sticking point is uh, whether there will be advanced consent rights regarding the enrichment and reprocessing of U.S. Uh, uh, fuel, or that is to say, U.S. origin fuel, and fuel that has gone through American reactors. Um, is that accurate? Can you comment on how the United States uh, intends to uh, address the enrichment and reprocessing uh, uh, in one, two, three agreements uh, with not only Korea, but Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and others. Uh, I realize that you don't want to negotiate uh, in public, but you're part of a democracy, and uh, uh, Americans would like to know what your position is going to be. <clears throat> well, you're right on several points. <clears throat> I wouldn't like to negotiate the entire agreement here in public. You are also correct that advanced consent on uh, use of U.S. supplied materials and technology for enrichment and reprocessing is an important issue in this agreement. Uh, I remain convinced that this issue, like everything else that we're discussing within the agreement, is susceptible to the kind of solution that careful, patient, economic, technical analysis will allow us to achieve. And that's exactly the purpose of the joint fuel cycle study that we initiated two years ago that will run for 10 years and that will serve as the basis for important joint decisions that we'll make about future fuel cycle in Korea. So that study will be done when? Uh, 2021. So you're seeking a extension for just two years. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to solve the problem in when you get the study results in 2021, but you're asking for a two-year extension. Um, enlighten me on the math of, of that. Uh, Certainly. Uh, how, are you going to be back here every two years for another two-year extension? God forbid. Uh, I mean, we are, been, how, how long have you been working on this? Uh, you've run out of time. You need another two years. Um, how's it going? We've been negotiating for three years, and I think it's going well. But I will uh, you've be been negotiating for three years, and you need another two years. There yes. are very few times where an argument lasts five years, and it's described as going well. But um, I hope you can get it done in two years. I will not characterize it as an argument, sir. It's complex, difference, without question. Uh, different, difference in approach. Um, okay. Um, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. The... Uh, Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Castro, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony this afternoon. I want to follow up on a little bit of your earlier answers to uh, my colleague's question over here. Um, let me ask you, have recent provocations by North Korea uh, affected our relationship with South Korea, and if so, how? 
I think if, if anything, it's only strengthened both sides' recognition that we need to work together very closely, both in order to deter provocations, but also to forge the right kind of diplomatic strategy that may begin to have an impact on North Korea. Sure. Uh, and with respect to the one, two, three agreements, can you describe how, how they advance the administration's goal of nonproliferation, essentially how these agreements make the United States safer? It is the longstanding policy of the United States, successive United States administration, I think given extra emphasis by President Obama and consistently supported by a strong majority in Congress to combat the proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world and specifically to discourage the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technology that are the technical bases for development of nuclear weapons. That remains our policy today. In order to achieve that policy, we employ, in cooperation with partners around the world, a wide variety of tools. We rely, for example, upon the Nuclear Suppliers Group, that voluntary grouping of nuclear-capable nations that have reached agreement on what they will and won't export to different partners around the world. Uh, we rely also upon the free market around the world in order to provide a reliable supply of uh, fuel for nuclear power plants, and we seek to supplement that with fuel banks located in the United States and in Russia to guarantee against any deficiencies in the market so that there is no reasonable economic incentive for a country to develop a new enrichment capability. And one of the tools we use as well is, of course, the nuclear cooperation agreements, one, two, three agreements, by which the United States not only establishes its presence in the international markets, but also is able to exert a benign influence upon states in order to further discourage the spread of such enrichment and reprocessing technology. And taken together, we think that these have been successful in discouraging the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technology. And there are 25 or so agreements across the world, is I that right? I think that's about right. I'll count them up again for you. Sure. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I think that's what it is. 24. 24. Uh, and what's been the effect on American industry um, yeah. because of these agreements? Well. When we are successful, as we generally have been, in concluding nuclear cooperation agreements, one, two, three agreements, uh, it gives a very uh, competitive American industry the ticket to go in and to persuade other countries, whether their utilities are private or public, of the important safety and economic benefits of U.S. supplied equipment. So it's enabled us to compete successfully around the world in a variety of countries. That said, the world is more and more competitive in this field. The United States has to do more in order to maintain its competitiveness with other countries, and we're committed to doing that. Thank you. I yield back my time, Chair. Gentleman yields back. Um, we have no additional uh, questioners, and uh, the uh, Chair and I have to go back to judiciary for the markup, so we won't go into a, a second round this afternoon. We thank the gentlemen for their testimony. Uh, members, without objection, will have five days to uh, supplement their statements or ask questions. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, you I also would like to commend our two witnesses for the uh, participation in this afternoon's hearing. I deeply appreciate their, uh, their understanding of the issues that we've uh, dealt with this afternoon. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And if there's no further business to come before the committee, we're adjourned. Thank you.